So we've got Claire Smith, dietitian from Diabetes SA and Pamela Kurgianis, diabetes educator from Diabetes South Australia. Welcome both. Thank you, Thanks, Bianca. So we're here to talk about National Diabetes Week, which is next week. So I, I thought it'd be great to talk, uh, talk about uh, this for our listeners. So if you can just start off uh, by telling us uh, firstly, I suppose, will we go with you, uh, Claire or, or Pamela? It depends uh, who, who wants to answer it. What are the types of diabetes, type one and two? But if you could just give us a brief uh, summary of both of those. I think I can cover that one, Claire. Sure. So there are a few different types of diabetes. The main types of diabetes are type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition where the immune system has attacked the pancreas and it's no longer able to make insulin, which is a hormone, and insulin is what we need to get the energy out of our blood, so that glucose, and into our muscles where we can use it. So for someone with type 1 diabetes, they're unable to make any insulin at all. Someone living with type 2 diabetes, it's a bit different. The insulin that they do make either doesn't work very well um, or they run the insulin that they make as well. Um, and then there's gestational diabetes, which is just a form of diabetes that is diagnosed during pregnancy um, and generally resolves after the woman has given birth. Okay. All right. And the main symptoms of diabetes? Um, so there's tiredness, increased thirst, um, increased toileting as well. Um, so what happens is that in diabetes, all the energy, the glucose or the sugar, it sits in the bloodstream and it's not in the parts of the body where it can be used for energy. So that's why people get tired. Um, and then they end up drinking a lot of water because they yeah. try to flush that glucose out of the bloodstream. And so they end up going to the toilet quite a lot as well. So what are some of the things that people can do to, um, you know, prevent this? Let's, let's start there. I suppose, is that something for you, Claire? Question for you? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, about 58% of uh, cases of type 2 diabetes can be prevented through healthy lifestyle. So that, that's things like healthy eating, regular yeah. activity, quitting smoking, reducing alcohol uh, intake, um, you know, high intakes of fruit and vegetables, those sorts of things. Um, but for other people, there is a, a, a genetic component as well, mm. um, age, gender, cultural background. So Aboriginal Australians and um, some culturally and like linguistically diverse communities are a much higher risk as well. So there's both what we call modifiable risk factors, things we can change, and then the non-modifiable yeah. risk factors, the things that we can't change all of them contribute to the development of type 2 diabetes especially. So what, smoking and drinking can increase chances of getting diabetes? Sure, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, evidence to support that. Uh, smoking especially is linked with a whole range of chronic conditions, not just diabetes, um, alcohol intake as well, but particularly the physical activity, the healthy eating, yeah. um, other factors as well. Mm. And what's a regular sort of blood sugar for someone who does not have diabetes? And then when, what are the levels that aren't good where it's creeping up? Sure. Um, so, Pamela, are you happy for me to answer that one? Sure. Um, so for someone not living with diabetes, blood glucose levels will fluctuate between about 3.5 to 8 millimoles per litre. Um, and someone... And that's through, say, like a finger prick test. Uh, someone living with diabetes, our aim is to uh, have their blood glucose levels as close to that kind of four to 10 range. Um, and that mm. can change depending on type of diabetes. Um, so really over 10, over 15 is where we start to be quite concerned for those uh, blood glucose levels. Mm. Now, you said it's also that genetic component. I mean... Obviously, people, if, it's, if it runs in families, and uh, can people, what can they do to avoid that? Again, just healthy lifestyle, more regular checkups, just be on top of it more and just eat a little bit differently? Yes, yeah, certainly those things can help. Obviously, um, 
We can't change genetics and family history. So if that is uh, a risk factor for someone, there's not a huge amount we can do about that in isolation. Yeah. Um, but as you said, uh, you know, focusing on the things that we can modify, the healthy mm. eating, the regular activity, all of those things will help yeah. reduce risk. Yeah. And can so stress and medications can affect this onset also? Do you want me to say that one, sir? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, high levels of stress for long periods of time can cause an elevation in blood sugar levels um, and potentially can increase the risk of someone developing diabetes. There are certain, certainly some medications as well, um, particularly medications to treat mental health conditions or things like steroids, which people may be on long term that can definitely contribute to the risk of developing type 2 diabetes as well. For someone to say, is the medications that I'm on, are they going to increase my risk of developing type 2 diabetes? And then I suppose the other thing people can do as well is that we do actually have a screening tool. So if people don't have diabetes, but they want to know if they Yeah, sorry, Pamela, we, we are just losing a bit of the audio, sort of on and off, we're losing the audio. Oh, sorry. Can you, is that a bit better? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how we go. Um, Claire, I was just talking about the Aussie risk tool. So maybe do you want to pick yeah. it up from there? Sure. Yeah. Um, so Pamela was just alluding to the OSD risk tool, which is a risk assessment questionnaire that people can go online. We have a, a mm. website called facethefacts.org.au mm. and it's a series of questions that um, guides the person through around age, gender, um, smoking, family history, mm those risk factors as well as healthy eating, waist circumference, physical activity. Um, each question has a score correlated to it that then gets totaled up um, to identify the person's risk uh, for developing type 2 diabetes in the next five years. Okay. Now, uh, I understand sort of uh, portion size is vital as well. You know, you hear people saying, you know, I can eat this, so I'm going to have a lot of it. I mean, obviously, we, we know that that's not the best thing. But can you just talk us through that, like nutrition and portion size? And actually, if we can also, while we're here, go into that, the point of what we should eat. Like maybe yeah, it's sure. some meal plans, breakfast, lunch, dinner and snacks. Yeah, so um, we do, I would say that we have a range of resources that people can access from the Diabetes SA website. They're downloadable, um, so you can certainly jump on there and have a look. Um, there is no specific one diet for all people living with diabetes. Mm -hmm. What we do know from evidence is that some dietary patterns are um, linked with reducing risk of diabetes, particularly uh, low glycemic index or low GI, people may have heard of that yeah. term before, um, Mediterranean dietary patterns, uh, in some cases lower carbohydrate uh, dietary patterns can be beneficial, um, but everyone is a little bit different. Mm. So we do encourage, particularly when people are diagnosed with diabetes, that they have a check-in with um, an accredited practising dietitian um, and you can access yeah. those through a chronic disease care plan. Um, but really, if we can take a step back, what healthy eating for people with diabetes looks like is what we would encourage all Australians to be doing plenty yeah. of vegetables, a little bit of fruit, grainy carbohydrates, uh, lean protein choices, uh, dairy foods, and some healthy fats and oils such as olive oil, um, drinking water, and just reducing our intake of what we call those sometimes foods or takeaway foods, those more highly processed foods that are much higher in sugar, salt, and fat, and they're um, the factors that will increase risk for diabetes. So what fruits are better to eat? Uh, things like berries have less sugar, bananas have too much sugar. What are some good fruits? Yeah, so there's a, a lot of misconceptions out there, particularly around fruit. All fruit is on the table. Uh, what we find is more important to talk about is the portion size. So yeah. with fruit portions, aiming for two serves per day, 
and a portion looks like something that fits into the palm of your hand quite comfortably. So an apple or a pear yeah. um, fits into your hand really comfortably. A um, mandarins are a bit smaller, so you might fit two of those equate to one serve. Okay. But sh should should we be avoiding, I mean, a diabetic wouldn't, wouldn't be wanting to have two pieces of fruit daily, would they? Yep, yep. It it's fits still okay. Healthy eating. We'd probably just encourage that all that, that fruit, which is a carbohydrate food, it does break down into glucose. We don't want to consume that all at once. So our advice tends to be to split that throughout the day. Maybe yeah. have a piece okay. of morning tea, a piece of afternoon tea, mm. rather than have a big serve all at once. And to um, try to uh, cut back on things like fruit juice that gets broken yeah. down very quickly by the body, your whole fruit is a much better choice. Mm -hmm. Now, what about uh, when women are going through menopause? Can that increase the chances of them getting diabetes? So it can, uh, menopause can uh, change hormones uh, in the body and that can certainly for women change um, how they're, they're storing their body weight and that typically means that weight starts to store around the abdomen um, and that waist circumference can mm. increase, which is a risk factor. Um, a larger waist circumference is a risk factor for developing yeah. type 2 diabetes. Um, so that can be a concern or something to think about um, if that's the, the stage of life that you're at or about to enter into. Um, mm. And things like regular physical activity can help counter some of those, um, I guess, consequences of things like menopause. Yeah. Gee, we can't underestimate the power of exercise and we hear that all the time for, for many different things. What well, isn't yeah. it just like half an hour a day or half an hour, three times a week? What, what do you recommend yeah. for diabetes? Yeah, we recommend uh, 30 minutes on most days of the week of um, exercise that gets your heart rate up, but you can still hold a conversation. So that might be going for a walk or yeah. um, for some a run or a bike ride. We also encourage that weight-bearing activity twice a week. So that might be um, something okay. that involves weights or resistance exercise. Um, and just get just moving more for some people is a really um, achievable goal. Uh, sitting less, moving more. So why are weights also good? Is it good for the bones? Yes. And yeah, it's good for bone strength and bone density. Um, and it's also... Basically, our muscles are like glucose sponges. They soak up the, the sugar or the glucose that's in our bloodstream and they use it when they're used. So you might have heard the saying, really? if muscles use them or lose them, our muscles love to use that glucose for energy. Um, so the more we move our body, the more our muscles are taking that glucose from the bloodstream and utilising it. So that helps mm. to lower blood glucose levels over a long period of time. But specifically, like having weights, using weights for different body parts. Yeah, yeah, that can certainly help build muscle as well. Um, and so the more muscle that we have, and it's not necessarily saying that we need to go out and be bodybuilders or anything yeah. like that, but um, muscle has that appetite for glucose or sugar. So the more muscle we have, um, the more the better able our body is able to use the glucose that's in our bloodstream. All right. Um, just a few questions uh, I've got here also from a few people that are curious. Uh, truck drivers, uh, people that are on the road, people with such jobs, you know, it's not always easy to have meals planned. What can they snack on? Nuts and seeds, fruit? Yeah, so anything that would um, we would classify as a core food is probably something more preferable. So core foods are typically our fruit, our vegetables, our dairy, our lean proteins, and that can certainly include things like nuts and seeds yeah. and our whole grains. So grainy crackers, cheese and crackers. Um, again, it depends on um, what's accessible, affordable and available around people. Um, but yeah. that's also where a one-on-one -on -one consult with a dietitian can really help to tailor um, what an individual um, is best suited to choosing or some ideas and strategies to assist them. Yeah. And so what are some of the things that can happen if people don't take care of their diabetes and blood sugar levels, if they get a little bit sort of relaxed and don't, you know, do follow all these things. 
Pamela, do you want to jump in here? Sure. Uh, we'll see how we go. If I start cutting out, just let me know and Claire can take over. Um, but there, because the blood flows throughout the whole body, that means the sugar and the glucose flows throughout the whole body. So the whole body could be affected if blood glucose levels are high. So particularly some areas of the body that we want to um, we would talk about is the heart. So people are at an increased risk of a heart attack. Um, the brain, they're at an increased risk of stroke, maybe lower limb amputations as well. And then there's some other areas like your kidneys or your eyes and the nerves that can be affected as well. So there's quite a large part of the body that can be affected by diabetes, but the important thing to remember is that it, um, with good lifestyle, healthy lifestyle habits, you can really help to manage um, blood glucose levels and bring them into that um, healthy range. And that helps to reduce or delay the development of those sorts of complications. Mm -hmm. And sometimes lifestyle might not be enough and you might need medications to help assist as well. And that's completely fine too. Now with insulin, people that take insulin daily, are there some days that they don't need it or, or I mean, how does that work? And, and are, are there effects? Does it like build up? Do you have to have less or more? Or does it have long-term effects? Does it affect the hair, the skin? Yeah. Um, so insulin um, these days is actually made really, really well. So it's pretty much identical to the um, insulin that our body makes um, on its own. So someone with type 1 diabetes, because they don't make insulin, they're going to need insulin every single yeah. day. And they'll need, there's a few different types of insulin. So there's one that lasts for a longer period of time and then one that's short acting that they would use before a meal. So they'll have to use both of those types of insulin. Mm -hmm. Someone with type 2 diabetes, though, they might only be on the long acting to start. And that would just to help the body manage those blood glucose levels. Because it's the insulin, it's similar to the insulin that our body makes, um, there's no real risks in terms of hair loss or, or um, like skin or anything like that. Um, some people will experience weight gain when they start insulin. So it's really important that you have mm. conversations with the doctor to make sure that they're adjusting the insulin so it's the right dose for you. Uh, so what, what is, you said it's pretty close, if not identical to human insulin then what's it made of it, um there's a few different um types of things that it's made of but these days so it, it used to be made out of like pig cells but these days it's um a chemical that was synthetically made in a lab so it mimics exactly the same as the insulin that our body makes as well uh, okay so so, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're the same do they still use the former no, <laughs> they, oh. not, not, no. <laughs> oh. but not they the, did, but not, they did. Yeah, that's how it started. Interesting. So it started from animals, yeah, and we've come a very wow. long way. So now we're pretty much at what humans make, yeah. So we don't use the, we don't use the pig one anymore. <laughs> well, well, they're using like um, pig arteries or, or well, I know someone who had a pig uh, valve put in their heart, you know, the... There's a place yeah, for all not, this stuff. I know it sounds a bit way out, but there's a place for it. Yeah. We've come a long way, though, with insulin. Yeah. We're going back years ago, though, this person. So, yeah, yeah you're right. Things have uh, definitely, definitely changed. All right. Okay. So we've got uh, well, we've got a few, a few more questions. Um, another question. Uh, we probably know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. Can it be reversed? you know, no more insulin. Like can someone sort of just miraculously wake up one day and not, you know, I don't know. <laughs> have you heard of those cases? Have you heard of those cases that, you know, they're told they'll have this forever and then they've done some drastic changes and, and they don't have it anymore? Yeah. So for someone with type 1 diabetes, that wouldn't be the case because their body is unable to make insulin. So they will not be able to reverse their diabetes. Someone with type 2 diabetes, if it's early on in their diagnosis and they've made significant lifestyle changes, they can potentially put their diabetes into remission. We would never say they yeah. cured themselves of diabetes though, because if they pick up those unhealthy um, lifestyle habits, the diabetes will come back. Um, that's why it's really important that we identify people early on um, and don't let them go for years and years and years without getting diagnosed with diabetes. Yeah. 
because the longer you've had it, the, it can be harder to get into that remission. It's not impossible, um, but it does require a fair bit of effort from the person. Okay. Um, and also life expectancy with people with type 1 diabetes is, is just the same as someone who doesn't have diabetes? Is it exactly the same or is it different? Um, well, well managed diabetes. Um, Claire, you might want to correct me on this, but if diabetes is well managed, I believe the life expectancy is similar to that of someone who doesn't have diabetes. Whereas if um, diabetes is not well managed um, and they develop complications early, then that can have an impact on um, lifespan. Yeah. Okay. Like was, driving uh, home that message of early detection. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. But I, I suppose it's, it's also, you know, you've heard people say, does the insulin, you know, okay, we say that people with type 1 diabetes can live on insulin perfectly well, but does it sort of affect other organs and does it have some negative effects like weaken something and then you need medication for that other? Yeah, no. So insulin itself, the real, um, I suppose, side effect of insulin is generally that weight gain um, yeah. because insulin does help to also store fat. Um, so it can have the ability to cause weight gain. But like I said earlier, our bodies make it and we're born with yes. it um, and we need it for so many other different um, things in the body as well. So it's not going to cause another like a negative effect on another part of the body because we make it and we do need it. Yeah. All right. Now, how can people, uh, what can people do firstly for next week? I mean, can they donate? Can they get involved? Are there, how can people help? Yeah, definitely. So um, National Diabetes Week is next week. Um, there's a few different ways people can get involved. If they're not currently living with diabetes, we would encourage people to go to the Face the Facts website, facethefacts.org.au and um, answer those questions of that OSD risk screening tool and see what their risk for diabetes is and follow up with your GP. Um, there's some tests yeah. that the doctor can do um, to see what your blood glucose levels are at at the moment. For people who are living with diabetes, uh, we're encouraging them to check in with their uh, medical team, so their GP, their diabetes educator. There's a process called the annual cycle of care, and that um, outlines all the checks that we're encouraging people living with diabetes to have done each year. So get their um, blood glucose levels checked, their blood pressure, cholesterol, feet. Um, there's a whole range of checks as yeah. part of that annual cycle of care. And the, uh, the goal of that is to really pick up if there's risk of any of those long-term effects or long-term complications so that we know about them early and we can do something about it to prevent them. And finally, for health professionals, um, we do have a campaign kit and some posters that people can um, distribute and put up in their workplaces um, to raise awareness of diabetes and what people can yeah. do about it. Um, and then the final thing is Diabetes SA is holding a seminar. We do this every year for National Diabetes Week at the Adelaide Convention Centre. Um, we have three different speakers and uh, they're focusing on some of the long-term, uh, some of the complications and effects of diabetes and how we can prevent and manage them. So um, if people jump onto our website, diabetessa.com.au, um, they'll be able to access those events, information and um, some of the campaign posters and, and kits. And you'll be sending them out or people can come to your office if they don't want to wait for, for it to be sent out? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Is there anything else we need to cover before we sign out? Don't think so. I think we've covered quite a lot today. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both very Thanks much for joining. Thanks, Bianca. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.